Hey, what's up, guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 100, and we're going to cover 1 Samuel chapter 28 through 31. We'll wrap this book up today. Last time we left off, David had spared Saul's life again. But then when he got back there, the text really doesn't explain it, but something tipped him off to flee again. Obviously, he could tell that Saul was changing in his disposition toward him. And so he goes to the land of the Philistines and he meets Achish and he serves with them there for over a year. And that's where we pick up in chapter eight. Let's look at verse one. Now it came about in those days that the Philistines gathered their armed camps for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, know surely that you will go out with me in the camp. You and your men, David said to Achish, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. So Achish said to David, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now Samuel was dead and all of Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had removed from the land those who were mediums and spiritists. So the Philistines gathered together and in this chapter, they're about to they're about to stage an attack and Saul is gathering his camp as well, but he's afraid and his fear causes him to inquire to the Lord, but the Lord doesn't answer him. He doesn't answer him in a dream or through the Umrum or by the prophets. So this is what Saul comes up with. He says, look, I know we've kicked all of the medium and spiritists out of the land. In verse seven, he says, seek for me a woman that I may inquire of her. And the servants say to him, behold, there is a woman who's a medium at Endor. And so even some of your chapter titles may even say the witch at Endor. And that's what it's talking about here. It's because he had kicked these people out. Saul has to go to the spiritists, to this medium, to this witch in disguise. And he goes to her and he says to her, conjure up for me, please. And bring up for me whom I shall name to you. And his lady says, how can I do this for you? For Saul has cut off all of the mediums and the spiritists from the land. And she's saying, why are you laying up a snare for me to be killed? She doesn't know this is actually Saul who made that law in disguise. And he says to her, look, as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you. And she does this thing. She goes through her motions, but Samuel actually comes up. And in verse 12, she gets scared. She cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul saying, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And he said, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a divine being coming up out of the earth. And he said to her, what is his form? She says, it's an old man coming up and he's wrapped with a robe. And Saul knew it was Samuel and he bowed his face to the ground and did homage. So Samuel has a conversation with Saul. He says, why have you disturbed me? And Saul answered, because I'm greatly distressed. The Philistines are waging war against me and God has departed from me and no longer answers me, neither through prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you will make known to me what I should do. And Samuel says to him, why then do you ask me since the Lord has departed from you and has become your adversary? The Lord has done accordingly as he spoke through me, for the Lord has torn the kingdoms out of your hand and given them to your neighbor, David, as you did not obey the Lord and did not execute his fierce wrath on Amalek. So the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord would also give Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines. Therefore, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Indeed, the Lord will give over the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Then Saul immediately fell full length upon the ground and was very afraid because of the words of Samuel. Also, there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day and all night. All right, let's stop and talk about this a little bit, because I know your mind is racing and going all over the place. First, Theo, you're telling me the Lord sends evil spirits. Now you're saying that Samuel, a godly man, is coming up through a witch and a medium and a spiritist. And I'm saying, hey, don't shoot the messenger. Allow me to explain. The best way to help us explain this is we have to go back to how God was moving with Pharaoh when he was freeing the people. And the definition of hardening someone's heart is to do to them what they already desire to do. So that's the first principle we need to get. 
And the second principle we need to get is in our minds, we like to see the battle between good versus evil, but we also like to think that God runs all of the good and Satan runs all of the evil. And I think that's a very bad way to think about things. God is king over everything. He superintends and is in control even of the evil, which is why he will judge it all in the end. So if he doesn't immediately attack it or deal with it, he's storing it up and keeping a record to deal with it at a future date. And if we know those two things, one, that God restrains evil, and when he hardens a heart, he allows that person to do what they already wanted to do, and he's sovereign over everything, those are two keys that help us unlock how God can use evil spirits. One, an evil spirit comes to torment Saul. Think about it like this. That evil spirit already wanted to torment Saul. The Holy Spirit had been restraining it the whole time. All the Holy Spirit has to do is lift those restraints, and that spirit will move forward and do what it wants to do. And so God superintends that. Just like with Pharaoh, Pharaoh already did not want to free the people. And so God superintends that and allows Pharaoh to do what he wants to do for his purposes to free his people. And he does it again here. This is why I wanted to cover this here, because we're seeing incidents over and over again. And I think this is a really good time to cover this. How could God be involved in the process that he condemns and calls wicked? Because think about it. Nothing has power apart from God. Even the lady knew the limits of her power. Even when she saw Samuel, she got afraid because she knew she had exceeded the limits of what she was able to do. In some sense, what she did worked with her using the forces of evil, but in some senses, she was a charlatan because she really couldn't truly contact the dead. It reminds me of the Egyptian court when the magicians of Pharaoh replicated the plagues of God. They were able to replicate the first two, but when they got to the third one, which was the gnats everywhere, the magicians weren't able to replicate that. They knew the limits of their power and they knew when they had run into a ceiling. And so that's what I'm saying here. God allows mediums and these spirits to have a short leash and to do certain things, but it's almost like, don't get it twisted. God can intervene and hijack that process whenever he wants to. And so the spirits are doing their thing and there is no territory that God cannot enter. A lot of times we like to think that hell is a place apart from God. It is in a sense that his blessed presence isn't there, but it isn't in the sense that his condemning and his judging presence is there. So God can enter into a realm like this, hijack the process because there is no authority but him bring about his righteous person there and all the participants and onlookers like this witch at Endor will be utterly shocked and amazed because they know somebody is on their territory in their domain that is more powerful than them. And, and that's what's happening here. God has hijacked the process and he's accomplishing his purposes on the enemy's territory. And this shouldn't confuse you. This should actually encourage you to say, wow, my God, controls everything. Even in evil, he can go into evil places and take over those territories. That should encourage you because death is an evil thing and we can't conquer it. But Jesus could go into death, conquer death, and remove the sting, remove the evil from death and the punishment from death. So things like death, things like Satan, things like demons, that they have no power outside of what God allows, and he can immediately come and circumvent that process anytime he wants. That should encourage you, brothers and sisters, not confuse you. We're going to see this one more time with Ahab and Jehoshaphat. There's going to be a battle, and it's going to come a time for this king to die. And God says, who will go and accomplish this for me? And the evil spirit is going to say, hey, I'll do it. And God says, go ahead. The same principle, that spirit wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all that's on his mind. 
he had been restrained up until that point, and God allows him to do that to accomplish his purposes. And he can do that in a holy way without being a guilty party. So this chapter ends with the lady giving Saul some food and him and his servants eat and they depart that night. And we move into chapter 29. Chapter 29 is the Philistines are going to battle and Achish has David with them, but the Philistines don't trust David. They're saying, how are we bringing a man that's part of the country, man, that we're fighting. This doesn't make sense. What if, what if he just turns on us in the middle of battle? Isn't this the one that they even say about that Saul has slain thousands and David has slain his ten thousands? And you get to see how David's fame is growing even into the territory of the Philistine. And Achish has to let David go. He says this in verse six, as the Lord lives, you have been upright and you're going out and you're coming in with me and the armies are pleasing in my sight. For I have not found evil in you from the day you are coming with me until this day. Nevertheless, you are not pleasing in the sights of my Lord. And it's interesting here because David is really in a compromising position because I don't think he would kill his own countrymen. And so there have been a few suggestions of maybe what he was doing or thinking similar to when he told Akish, hey, I don't want to stay in the city. Put me in the country. It was almost like, one, I don't want to be amongst your pagan people. And two, I don't want to be involved in any of the dealings that you have. I just want to flee away from Saul. So some people have said that this may have been lip service, him saying, hey, I'll fight. I'll go to battle with you just for Akish to say, no, you stay home. You don't have to go. Or David could be capitulating and compromising. But one thing we do know that is that David is being refined and he still needs to be refined, just like Joshua forgot to seek the Lord with the Gibeonites. David didn't seek the Lord when he came to this Philistine land. And that's our practical application today. You can be seeking the Lord faithfully for multiple days at a time, even months. And then you just get in the groove of making decisions apart from God. And what's going to happen to you is because you don't seek the wisdom of the Lord, you're going to put yourself in compromising positions where you're stuck. It's like, man, if I do this is wicked, if I do that, this is wicked. It's because you backed yourself in a corner and you started to move without seeking the Lord. And so the encouragement here is to learn from our older brothers and sisters who've gone before us to get in the habit of seeking the Lord regularly, daily, every morning, every decision, and just making a habit of doing life with God and not separating yourself or your decisions from him, not even being formal in everything, mastering the informal. This is what's going to make you the godly is not making sure you pray when you wake up, that you say your grace and that you seek him before big decisions. It's mastering the informal, walking with him while you're driving in the car, walking with him while you're doing mindless activities. When you can master dwelling and abiding with God in the informal, you're going to grow leaps and bounds beyond the formal Christians. Like I know a lot of formal Christians who do all of the things. They check all of the boxes. They do their family devotions. They say grace. They're there at church when all of the doors open. But it's a dichotomy there where they haven't mastered the informal. And it's like they can cut their relationship with God on and off like a light switch. You don't want to be that guy or that gal. You want to dwell with Yahweh all the days of your life. For in that, you won't put yourself in compromising positions. And so the Philistines depart without David. And we move into chapter 30 and 31. And in chapter 30, it's interesting. David and his men go to Ziklag and the Amalekites make a raid on David and they kidnap his two wives and their sons and daughters. And David has to come up with a plot to rescue his family and to win this battle. And you just see the sovereignty of God all throughout this. There's a random Egyptian sitting in the field in verse 11. And David inquires to him. He gives him bread and drink. And he finds out that he was with the Amalekites. And this guy promises to tell him where they are if he doesn't kill them. And so they do. And David goes in. And he slaughters them from twilight to evening of the next day. And not one of the men escaped except for 400 young men who rode camels and fled. 
That's in verse 17. And so David rescued his two wives and, and recovered all that the Amalekites had taken. And this chapter ends with David giving a law because 200 men stayed behind. They were tired. And it says that the wicked men who went with David said, we won't divide any of these fools with the people that stayed behind because they didn't do any of the work. And David says this. He says, you must not do so, my brothers, for what the Lord has given, who has kept us and delivered us into the hand of the band that came against us. Who will listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down to the battle, so shall his share be who stays with the baggage. They shall share a light. And I love this. David is saying everybody matters. The people who went to battle matter and the people who stayed back with the baggage matter. And this has so much application in today. In the church, we like to penalize people for not doing what we do. If we go evangelize, we talk about the people who don't evangelize. If we're praying, we talk about the people who aren't in a prayer meeting. If we're in evening service, we talk about the people who aren't there. If we're doing these godly, heroic efforts, we're talking about the people who aren't doing it. But if they're a godly brother and sister, they're doing something. And we need to practice better unity where we divide the spools with everybody. If people are going in the trenches, evangelizing, bringing souls into the church, that soul is for the kingdom of God and everybody can rejoice because people were holding down the fort while you were in the trenches. And if you're a prayer warrior and your prayers are being answered because you have the gift of faith, a person with the gift of service who was moving the chairs around should benefit from that gift as well. And I think we have to do a better job of honoring everybody's gift, especially if they're faithful. Now, I'm not talking about faithless people who aren't doing what they should do and they're just practicing mediocrity in the church. Of course, those people need to be rebuked, but we do need to watch our hearts where we're not binding the conscience of other brothers and sisters when they're being faithful in other areas. We need to draw this principle from David and may that minister to our hearts. And chapter 31 ends with Saul and his sons being slain. Just like Samuel said, they're fighting with the Philistines. And verse two says, the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons and the Philistines killed even Jonathan and Abinadab and Malkishua, the sons of Saul. And the battle was heavily against Saul and the archers hit him and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and pierce me through with it. Otherwise, these uncircumcised will come and pierce me through and make a sport of me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. So Saul took his sword and fell on it. And the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, and he also fell on his sword and died with them. Thus Saul died with his three sons and armor bearer and all his men on that day. And Samuel prophecy comes to pass, and the Philistines do something wicked. They take Saul and the three sons, they cut their heads off, they stripped them of their weapons, and they sent them throughout the land of the Philistines, and they placed their weapons in the temple with the Ashtaroth, and they fastened their bodies against the wall. And basically, this is how our chapter ends. Some valiant men come, and they take the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall, and they burned them, and they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted for seven days. And that's how the chapter of 1 Samuel ends. We have no king. The king who was stripped a long time ago is now dead. And guess what 2 Samuel is about to do for us? The true king of God's choice is about to rise up. And we're about to see that all through 2 Samuel. It's about to focus on the life of David. And we've seen what a king shouldn't look like. Now let's continue our journey of seeing what a king should look like. Looking forward to tackling this with you guys. Take care.